looked at every legendary trio to find out which one is the best. With nine games out, it was hard to pick the top three and even harder to find out which one deserved to be at number one. But based off my intense research, ladies and gentlemen, we got them. So who are the three that stand above all and which one is the greatest trio in the entire Pokemon franchise? Before we can talk about the number three spot, we have to understand what makes a great legendary trio. Because after all, this isn't opinion based, this is all facts, Yo, I am fire. about to cook. When people talk about their favorite Pokemon game, they normally mention those badass moments where the world is about to explode or something. Just your average day in Kalos, dealing with a madman that's about to nuke the world. The best games are the one where the legendary trio play a massive role in a story, almost feeling like their own characters in the plot because you tell me the last time someone spoke about those Paldea bums, I mean, I mean the quartets, I'll wait. Why are they there? Where do they come from? A great trio adds more depth to the region. The reason behind their existence should world build because after all, this isn't your Route 1 Pidgey that happens to be flying around, but literal gods and titans. Being cave dwellers or a part of the factory maintenance crew is really just a root Pokemon with special treatment. Looking at you, Heatran. Looking cool is important. I like my mons dripped out. I've seen one too many red pill videos to know if you don't look threatening ain't no one gonna take you seriously design doesn't just mean how intimidating the pokemon looks does a legendary mon's design visually fit its role or inspiration exhibit a solgaleo visually fits its role as the sun pokemon lions are traditionally associated with the sun shout out to the homie escanor it has a bright color scheme bright like the sun oh brother this guy its name Sogaleo has many interpretations. Sol comes from the Roman god of the sun. Galileo was the man who discovered the earth and revolved around the sun. Put that together and boom, Sogaleo. With the criteria established, let's get into the top three. Real quick, write in the comments who'll make the top three. If you get it right, then uh, you are indeed a true Pokemoner. What comes to your mind when you think about Hoenn? Sandy beaches? Vast lands? Beautiful region overall. Well, guess what? None of that would have existed if it wasn't for the weather trio, mostly. Shout out to my homie Reggie. Each of them has a role that fulfills a purpose in the games. Groundhound raises the land. Places like Rustboro City, Old Arrowtown, or Route 113 wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Groundhound. All of the water routes in the Hoenn regions, places that we can dive down to, wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Kyogre. Requia the Rayquaza, the trio master, exists to make sure one side doesn't go overboard. Yo, shout out to Rayquaza, bro. I got a Rayquaza. The key to a prosperous region is a balance of having plenty of land to develop and a vast ocean for Pokemon to sustain themselves. And to make sure that balance isn't offset, Rayquaza sent both Kyogre and Groudon into caverns to chill. The environment of the Cave of Origin will reflect the game that you're playing. Versus Kyogre, you're gonna ride on its back to get into his cavern, a beautiful, glistening underwater cave. Versus Groudon, this time you ride on its back to get to his cave. The atmosphere is very serenic, with the music really setting the tone for the battle that's about to take place. The fate of the entire Horn region depends on me throwing this Master Ball at this giant monster. So when it comes to the lore of the region, they expand on it really well. They're not at the number three spot because they suck, it's just the two ahead of them take it up a massive notch. In the games, the story is reflected on what version you buy, so it's important to talk about the motivations of the main antagonist. Team Aqua is the dumbest for sure, making Lysandria look like a genius in comparison. Archie wants to flood the land completely. He thinks by drowning out the people, Pokemon will again prosper. Don't worry about the fire and rock and you know, every other type that is isn't water, they'll be I. Since Archie is a driving force in the Sapphire games, we spend our time trying to stop Team Aqua from getting and using the Blue Orb. We first stop him in the Oceanic Museum from getting it. Crisis adverted, well, at least for 10 minutes, because they end up getting the orb on Mount Pyrite. It's okay. They still don't know where the big blue was at. Until, of course, Plot had something to say about it. Captain Stern made a public discovery on the C4 cavern and was about to go down there with this perfectly functioning submarine. <laughs> Would be a awful shame if Team Aqua was hiding in the cut like Kira waiting for a sandwich. So they take the submarine to awaken Kyogre and now it's time to stop the extinction of humans and 90% of Pokemon. Ignoring how ridiculous the storyline is, the presence of Kyogre is always there and we're constantly trying to stop Team Aqua from awakening him. He doesn't just appear with little buildup like other legendaries will mention. Switching over to Team Magma, their plan makes more sense. Maxi wants to raise land, giving people more space to build and develop civilization. The series of events of getting the red orb is the same as the blue orb counterpart, so no need to repeat ourselves here. Maxi hoped he would be able to control Groudon, pretty much playing Hoenn on creative mode. That did not happen. Instead of a flood, now our goal is to stop an intense drought from wiping out all of life. 
Now, the main reason why the trio isn't any higher and only at number 3. The build-up for Rayquaza is not there. In Emerald, the only reason why we even know about his existence is just a box art. Other than that, no one talks about him, he just shows up at the end out of the blue. Yeah, he stopped the two mods from ending it all in Emerald, but then he just dipped out, never to be seen again. In the remakes, we get to use him to fight Deoxys, still pretty much just a cameo. Maybe if there was like a Delta Emerald to build on the story, then the trio could have maybe been moved up, you know, or, or Sigma Emerald. Well, at least he didn't get the Zygar treatment. Let's talk about their designs. Mwah, a chef Sakisa. Sugimori nailed the design of each Titan. The two not only perfectly convey what part of the ecosystem they're responsible for, but that they're the head honcho of each department. It doesn't take a genius to take one good look in Kyogre and say, Oh wow, well, that's a water god. The kaiju aesthetic for ground on fits really well considering that he raises up land with lava. Rayquaza is the only one you have to search up to find out what does he really represent. There are many examples like a Japanese dragon or Kukulkan, a Mayan deity. You also get an idea of how old each Pokemon is from the symbols on their body. So to recap, their lore builds on the region, their existence impacts the story, and their design conveys that ancient aesthetic. Giving this trio a rating, it would be a 8.5 out of 10. Which is pretty good if you ask me. Like I said earlier, these guys aren't at the number three spot because they suck it's just the two we're about to talk about right now are just that much better this was close the tau trio could have been number one i really wanted them to be though they do have a couple fumbles that held them back let's first talk about what they do better than arguably every other box art the entire story of the unova games revolves around truth and ideals the antagonist of the game end was gaslit into believing that all pokemon were prisoners to their trainers from an early age getsis only brought an abused pokemon to play with so for the entire the entirety of the Unova game, he wants to liberate the Pokemon from their perceived captors. In order to do this, he needs two things. One, beating the Elite Four champion, and since Alder is a bum, the second is obtaining a powerful Pokemon. And since this isn't competitive, Landorus T is not gonna cut it. Only Reshiram or Zekrom can get that job done. So these two were one of the first box stars that didn't like shape the region or anything. Their importance comes from their strength and what they symbolize. Reshiram representing truth and Zekrom representing ideals. Even though N is canonically shown with Reshiram the most, I personally feel like Zekrom fits him best. N's vision of the world is based off what he thinks is ideal, not true. Which is contrasted by us, the player, in all of our whole some experiences with our Pokemon. The role of the two dragons is more thematic than alarming. What gives the Tau Trio a leg up over the weather is Kirum. The Unova games had the luxury of being sequels instead of expanded remakes, meaning the Trio Master doesn't just show up for one moment out of the blue with no build up and calls it a day. The entire threat of Black and White 2 is Kirum himself. After Getsis gets put in a body bag, two years later he comes back and says, Fine. I'll do it myself. Now the plan is to freeze all of Unova and take over. Okay, probably easier ways of going about things, but I guess that works too. It's all fun and games until the attack on Opalkid City, where we get to see what's gonna happen to the rest of the region if Getsis gets his hand on the completed dragon. Each dragon has a role in the story. The player covers truth and covers ideals, and Getsis is the absence of either. Since the three are inspired from the yin and yang, their color scheme fits them very well. Now the reason they're at the number two spot and not one, because man, I really wanted them to be number one. They have the best story out of any legendary trio and feel like they've been given the most effort for us, the player, to connect with. But they add nothing to Yanova's lore. I know there's some bullshit after the fact story about two brothers having a war about truth and ideals. Let me just explain the lore real quick. Two heroes united all of Yanova from a war using a single powerful dragon Pokemon. After taking over, they got into a disagreement about seeking either truth or ideals. Whoa. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And somehow, this magically split Kirim into two Pokemon. The brother who wanted to pursue Truth handled Reshiram, and the one who wanted to pursue Ideals handled Zekrom. They got into a fight, destroyed all of Unova, the end. Yeah, I get it, I'm not blind, alright? I see how the player in End reenacted the story. But, who gives a shit about the story in the first place? I'm not emotionally invested into that story, and 99.9% .9 chance you aren't either. But, stand proud, guys. You are strong. The impact of the lore doesn't compare to like the Weather Trio, for example, who shaped their region into what it was, or the Gen 9 box charge, believe it or not. Since they represent the past and present, their existence builds upon Area Zero. If the Tau Trio had a more natural feeling lore that connected to Yanova, then combined with their excellent story, they could have easily been at number one. Number two is still a W, just as his Gojo. <laughs> The rating for these guys is a 9.3 out of 10. The light trio slander ends today because these guys are the great. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. This isn't really much of a hot take, but let me explain why the creation trio is the best in all of Pokemon. When Arceus created everything, it gave Dialga control over time, Palkia over space, and Garatina got the short end of the stick. One of the first aspects that make them stand out is their side trio actually plays a role in their story. If Dialga and Palkia were to ever get like wildly furious and like almost destroy everything, that's where Azelf, Uxie, and Mesper come into play to calm them down. Unlike the Regis for Hoenn or Swords of Justice for Unova, who just exists with little connection to their box arts. All right, history time. Get your textbooks on page 59. During the Hisui period, the Celestica folk worshiped the three deities, two after Garotina was banished. This also explains how the statue in Interna City got there. Garotina, angered by the banishment, caused a rift in space and time, sucking in people from the future. Dialga and Palkia, not being too happy with their gig being copyrighted, went mad. All this resulting in the events of Legends Arceus, where the player must stop Garotina from destroying the world. About 150 years or so later, we get the events of Platinum. Another psycho wants to reshape the world in his image. And again, we must stop him. Cyrus, using the red chain, summons Dialga and Pokia to do just that. This time, though, Garotina knows what's up and doesn't want to get jumped again. So he swallows Cyrus and takes him into the distortion world. With the help of the Lake Trio, we locate Cyrus with Cynthia to end his shenanigans for good. Afterwards, Dialga and Palkia are free to continue uh, managing everything. Guys, it's like actually not fair. Any other trio being at number one would just be fraudulent activity on my end. The Creation Trio are literal gods who control time, space, and antimatter. Without them, there is no Pokemon. And in simple terms, when it comes to lore, they don't expand on just Sinnoh, but the entirety of the Pokemon universe. When it comes to complementing the theme or vibe of their game. There's no comparison either. For example, the Kanto birds just exist to exist at least until Lugia came along. The Tau Trio, as we mentioned earlier, don't really have much of a connection to Yanova outside of that shoehorn in story. You could say the same thing about the Combat Trio as well, since most of their influence to Galar is based off of folklore. The Aura Trio unfortunately got shafted hard. They don't even control all of life and death, they're more so representatives. The only reach you can make for them connecting to their region is how beautiful they look since Kalos is all about beauty. Even the Pokemon that do expand on their region's lore like the Johto Beast or the Light Trio for Alola, they do it well, but just not as well as the Creation Trio. And finally, when it comes to legendary Pokemon design, is it not fair to say that the Creation Deities are peak? You can't get any more legendary than this, just make sure you're not in Hisui. The art of the legendary Pokemon Trio ain't easy to fulfill and holds a lot more weight than people think. It can make or break the outlook of fans for the game for years to come. People love Gens 3, 4, and 5 for many reasons, and one being how impactful the legendary trio was for those games. Then playing a meaningful role in the story holds the tension to a very high standard that keeps the player invested in the story. But you know what? Don't just take my word for it. Watch my last video where I talk about how a underdeveloped legendary trio led to the stories of Pokemon X and Y holding back Kalos from becoming one of the best Pokemon games that could have ever been. 